my space age microphone. Excellent. Well, good. Um, I've got a lot of slides to go through, um, and, and, and not a lot of time. And I'll, I have a bad habit of speaking very quickly, which is probably annoying to Americans, and is probably extra annoying to people who aren't native English speakers. So I'll try to speak at a normal pace. And if I don't, wave your arms or yell at me or something. Um, but what I want to talk about today is looking at, you know, there's a lot of tools available in, in the application security or in the software security space. You know, a lot of scanning tools, code scanners, application scanners, and a lot of focus gets placed on them. But a challenge that we see with a lot of organizations that we work with is, you know, a, they, a lot of scanners get bought, but not a lot of scanners get used, or much, much less scanning gets done than people expect. And so what I want to talk about are some critical things to look at not just in getting a scanner, but in rolling out a structured scanning program across all the applications in your organization's portfolio. Uh, I'm Dan Cornell, um, and I'm a software developer by background, uh, originally in Java, um, spent some time in .NET, but I've spent probably the last seven or eight years really focused, looking, working with organizations to answer the question, you know, how is the software that you're developing or fielding internally um, how does the software that you're deploying impact your organization's security posture? Uh, and so I'm a developer that has come into the security space as opposed to someone from a more traditional pen testing background that's now looking at web and mobile applications. Um, and that colors, I think, what I, what I say. Um, so I'm curious, of the, of the people here, um, how many of you all in your organizations uh, have purchased a, a, some sort of a scanner? Excellent. How many uh, uh, static scanners, code scanners? Excellent. Dynamic scanners? Excellent. Both? Excellent. Um, Desktop-based scanners? Uh, the, the, you know, kind of the server-based enterprise options, any folks? Some people using the cloud to do your scanning? Excellent. <laughs> good. And so uh, uh, it, it's good. That's it, pretty good coverage. I'm, I'm curious, uh, who here is happy with their scanner? <laughs> It's, it's okay to be happy with your scanner. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, it, it, and that's what we, we see. You know, a lot of people say uh, yes for certain things, but no, you know, kind of. A lot of people aren't sure. Um, what we find in a lot of organizations is people have uh, purchased scanners, um, but they haven't actually used them. So uh, you know, they go through this big process to benchmark the scanners, and you fight with your boss to get funding allocated. And, uh, and then you finally get to your purchase order, you go buy the scanner, and the week you get your license key, you like run around and scan a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and then there's like a service outage, and you, you know, forget about the scanner and go do the you know, important operational stuff. And then people forget to come back and actually use the scanner later. <laughs> um, and so we've talked to a lot of folks where they say, yeah, we spent a whole bunch of money with the uh, XYZ scanner vendor a year ago, and we've scanned six of our 200 applications, right, or something, you know, something like that. And so that is a that's a real problem because uh, you know I mean there's there's excellent open source scanners um, you know there's the uh, excellent commercial scanners as well you know for a lot of organizations this is a significant investment of budget and so to invest that budget but not get the corresponding benefit on the flip side of that is really unfortunate um, and I think it makes it a lot harder to push your program forward if uh, you know when the boss comes back around after a year and says we spent all this money um, you know ac acquiring this technology you know what have you what have you done with it you haven't done anything you know you you you, know, you haven't scanned as many applications or you scanned a bunch of applications but you haven't fixed any of the vulnerabilities um, and so that is uh, you know, that, that's kind of some of the things that I want to talk about things that we've seen <clears throat> so you know when, when I look at security in an organization you know it's really looking at things it, it, what kind of a program is put in place so that you can repeatedly create secure software so that you're reducing you're reducing risk um, I wish I had a, you know again this is something that requires people but also process and technology um, which is I feel like a slide that you have to have in every uh, security program oriented uh, uh, you know, talk. Um, I wish I had a Sun Tzu quote. I don't know if that's as uh, popular over here in the States. Every good security talk has a Sun Tzu quote uh, from the art of war. Um, you know, honestly, given the state of application security, I think we'd be better off you know, basing our talks on Dalai Lama quotes about peace and love and happiness. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, again, uh, you know, as part of an overall program, uh, you know, scanning both uh, of source code and of applications is, uh, you know, th those activities play an important part. 
um, a real red flag that we see when we go in and talk to folks, uh, you know, and, and we ask a question, you know, hey, what, what is your organization doing for software security? And they say, we bought this scanner, right? We bought, I don't want to pick anybody out, uh, you know, but you know, we, we, bought, we bought this scanner. I said, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm sure you had some fun playing golf with the sales rep, and and uh, and uh, now you've got the scanner. <laughs> but what are you actually doing with the scanner, right? You know, how often have you run it? You know, what percentage of the applications, uh, you know, are are, are, you, are you running against, and are you running it in a way that you're actually getting results back that make sense? Um, and that's uh, so you, the, the challenge is in a lot of places, especially um, you know, folks that are driven by compliance requirements. Uh, you've got a checkbox. You know, what do you have? you have? We've got a scanner. Yes. You know, thank you. We've got a scanner. Um, and we've seen two uh, or a couple different uh, you know, anti patterns that we see for organizations when they try to roll this out. You know, the first one I call the uh, dude with the scanner approach. Um, I know that women in AppSec is a big focus of OWASP, so you'll all be thrilled to know that this can also be implemented as the lady with a scanner approach, right? <laughs> um, either way, either gender. Uh, you know, but this is a, you know, a lot like what I talked about is you, know, you get the scanner, you hand it off to an analyst, you know, they scan, 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 uh, email 300 page PDF reports to development teams, uh, you know, saying fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, uh, priorities shift somewhere else. And you look up at the end of, uh, you know, over, over a period of time and you look up and you see, you know, we haven't really scanned a lot of, uh, a good percentage of our applications. You know, we haven't, uh, maybe in certain cases we haven't gotten, uh, you know, good scans of the applications that we did look at. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we, uh, you know, we haven't been back and what we found is that none of the developers have actually fixed anything, right? And so the, the state of the world hasn't gotten any better. Uh, you know, and uh, one approach that some organizations take is to shift this and use some of the cloud providers um, to do the scanning for them. And this, in, uh, you know, for, for certain organizations, this works really well. Um, but we've also seen a lot of folks working with the cloud providers where they've bought a whole bunch of scanning, um, but they're, again, they're, you know, they maybe haven't gotten the applications onboarded and um, you know, put underneath this coverage. Um, again, it's great to buy this stuff, but it's important to actually use it. And so the three things you know, and, and you, um, you optimize or shift these around for different organizations, but the three big things that we look at when we talk to organizations about their scanning programs, looking at, you know, what's the breadth of their scanning? You know, do you have a good portfolio of applications in your organization? Do you know what your attack surface is? Because then you can identify, you know, of the applications that we have under scanning and testing, what percentage of that attack surface are we actually covering? Um, you know, also looking at depth, are you getting good scans, right? Are you doing manual testing along with that? Are you looking at dynamic, you know, both dynamic and, uh, and, and, and static aspects of the application? <clears throat> and, uh, and as I said, are you getting good scans? Um, you know, we went into one financial organization, they were very proud of themselves because they have a giant 500 page, their flagship web application has about 500 pages and they bought a scanner, pointed the scanner at the application and it found zero vulnerabilities, right? They're perfect at application security. The only problem was they hadn't trained the scanner to log in. So they scanned the home page <laughs> and the login page <laughs> where there were no vulnerabilities. You know, bravo. There's no SQL injection on the login, right? So it's no WebGoat. Uh, <laughs> better than WebGoat. But, uh, but, but once they trained it to log in, <laughs> you know, what they found was, uh, yes, indeed, maybe there were some things that they should be paying attention to. <laughs> um, and so that's really a question of depth. You know, for the scanning or other assurance activities that you're undertaking, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, are, are you getting good coverage inside of each application? And then finally, looking at the frequency of the scanning. Um, you know, applications. Uh, you know, s some applications are end of life and they don't change very quickly. Um, other applications are under pretty active development and are changing regularly. Um, you know, and you talk to certain organizations that have bought very deep into DevOps, and you see organizations that are pushing new code. You know, tens or even hundreds of times a day. Um, you know, but even in, uh, you know, kind of slower, more waterfall-oriented environments, you're probably still pushing code, you know, once, once a month, once every two months, something like that. And so an important question is to ask, like, how frequently are, go are we going back and looking so that we you know, can identify situations where the state of the security of the application has drifted out from under us? And we see um, a, a couple of different types of misses. You know, the first, you know, when it comes to breadth, um, inadequate application portfolio. How many folks here have a list of all the applications in their organization? 
okay, a couple folks, that's good, that's good. How many people wish they had a list of all the applications in their organization? <laughs> Yeah, and so that's a challenge, right? If you don't know about attack surface, it's going to be really hard to make any sort of assertions about the security of that attack surface. <clears throat> um, you know, and uh, so even or, you know, so even if you do know about the applications, if you're not testing them, then you know, again, you've got a, you've got concerns with the breadth of the coverage of your program. Uh, the depth misses. Um, you know, some scanners are better at others at uh, you know crawling certain applications. If you have RESTful applications, some of the scanners aren't as good at mapping out and spidering the uh, uh, you, know, you know spidering sites. <coughs> um, you know, if you've got code you know code scanning tools, sometimes they don't understand languages, they don't understand frameworks, and so uh, you know those can lead to situations where you think you've run a scan, but you don't necessarily have an effective scan. And so whatever the technology was supposed to do to identify vulnerabilities, you know, because it wasn't able to crawl, because it wasn't able to deal with the CSERF protection, or for for whatever reason, um, you know, the the, the scanner is producing suboptimal results. Um, you know, we also see uh, you know that leads in a lot of cases to false negatives, where there are vulnerabilities in the application that obviously you don't know about, uh, that the scanner didn't identify, but potentially you can have a false sense of security because, you know, we ran scanner XYZ against it and, uh, and, it, and it came back with, uh, you know, with, with no problems. Um, you know, also false positives. You know, how many folks have problems with false positives with their scanning tools? Right. And that's uh, you know, going to be a, a fact of life with any sort of automation, um, but especially if you're looking to take the results of these tools and put them in the hands of developers, um, it's really, really, you know, it sets up a very bad interaction if you ship a report to developers and a high percentage of the results are false positives or are uh, you know, low impact or things that the developers uh, you know, really don't necessarily need to care about. Um, and so that's a, another challenge that we see uh, from, from a depth standpoint where you don't get the insight because there's too much data to sort through. Uh, and finally, you know, frequency misses where you know, applications aren't being scanned often enough, where there is enough change going on with applications that potentially you know, could be introducing new vulnerabilities, um, but because you're not scanning, you don't, uh, uh, you, 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 you don't actually recognize these changes. And so, you know, for each organization, you're going to have different priorities, but there's things that you can think about when you look at rolling out this scanning program. You know, do you first need to look at your entire attack surface and at least do some sort of a check? You know, hey, I want to know that I've looked for SQL injection and cross-site scripting on all the publicly available pages for all of our organization's web properties. All right? <clears throat> you know, that is a that is a goal. It's a no, you're not a, a finishing point, but it's a, but it, but it's a you know in a lot of cases it's a perfectly legitimate starting point. And so that may be the way that you allocate your resources to say, let's get an enumeration of all of our applications, and I want to run a very basic scan against all of these uh, all of these apps, so that I at least know, you know, do I have any really horrible stuff hanging out there that that is, uh, that is, uh, you know, that's exposing me to, to risk, you know. Or you may want to take a deep dive on certain critical applications, you know, where you're doing both automated scanning as well as manual assessment, manual review, um, where you have applications that are covered by compliance or they're really valuable or other uh, you know, things like that. Uh, and another thing that I think is really important, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the in the demo that I'll show you in a moment, um, scanning, like finding vulnerabilities, is is fun. Yeah, pen testers in the room. Like, I mean, it's it's it's, it's fun to find vulnerabilities. Um, in most cases, especially when you're starting out, it's easy to find vulnerabilities. Um, but while finding vulnerabilities is fun, fixing vulnerabilities is actually valuable, right? And like at, at the point, you know, you, you the scanning is great, but it's not an end in and of itself. It's the you know, you know one stepping stone on the way to actually reducing your risk. And so you have to take the results of your scanning typically give them, you know, get them over to the developers, get the developers to care about them uh, and take some action, make changes to the code, get that code pushed into production, uh, and at that point your world actually got a little bit better. Um, and so that's a really important thing as you look to roll out assurance programs in your organization is to understand finding the vulnerabilities is, is, is great fun, uh, an important first step, but like the world actually gets better when you fix these things and, uh, you know, and, and reduce your exposure. <coughs> Um, so, again, you know, we talked a little bit about this in a program. You need to make sure that you've got a solid understanding of your attack surface. You've got to have realistic understanding of what to expect from the different, uh, you know, technologies that you're using for scanning as well as any manual follow-up that you're doing. 
Um, you know, it's important to have a disciplined approach to this, whether it's calendar based or whether it's release based. Um, but again, there needs to be some discipline for it. And you have to prioritize because you don't have, a, you know, you, or at least I don't know, I don't have infinite resources in my organization. Um, you guys may have, anybody here have infinite pen test, infinite time, infinite budget? No? <laughs> right. And so you've got to prioritize your testing efforts. So one of the things to look at is what is your software attack surface? You know, you know, what's your exposure? And this is probably not terribly easy to read, um, especially for folks in the back. The slides obviously will be online. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so it's important to go through a process of identifying what applications do we have. And so most organizations that we look at, when they first start thinking about software security, they're concerned about critical legacy systems and maybe like really important or very notable web applications. Right? And why is that? It's because you know, they've got uh, you know, service level agreements for, with customers. A lot of money flows through them when the application is down. People notice. Um, so these are the things that people first think about when they think, you know, what is our software attack surface? Um, you know, but then you start to expand that and figure out, well, we have all these different lines of business, and they've developed applications and deployed applications. So you start to include those in your portfolio and understand that you're exposed because of those as well. You know, and then you start to look at the you know, packaged applications that you have in your organization. No. And then finally you realize when it comes to mobile applications in the cloud, right, especially when it comes to the cloud, any person that has a corporate credit card is all of a sudden their own purchasing agent, right? So they can go and you know, fire up salesforce.com or some, you know, all these other software as a service providers. You know, all of a sudden your corporate data is flowing into those environments and you need to be concerned about them. Uh, you need to be concerned about that data. Um, but that's a tax surface that in a lot of organizations people don't even realize that they have. Uh, another thing where we see a lot of challenges here is in mobile. Um, I had a very interesting conversation uh, on, on the phone, this has been a year or so ago. Uh, we were talking with an organization that we do some work with and uh, said, well, hey, I'm giving a talk about mobile security. And they said, oh, we're thinking about rolling out a mobile app. Uh, so maybe we'll send one of our people to see that talk. And uh, you know, the, one of the other, uh, the sales guy that was on the phone actually Googled and he said, actually your iPhone app has been out for, uh, you know, for like three months and your Android app you know, rolled out last week. And what had happened in this organization is you know, somebody had gone, you know, the, uh, whoever marketing had gone to IT and said, we want a mobile application. And IT said, great, we'll get started on that in two years. Right? Like that's, our, that's our time frame to start new applications. And so what they did is they said, okay, they went to an outside firm, uh, you know, an offshore development firm. You know, they built them an application, uh, you know, packaged it up, put it in the app store, boom, <laughs> a mobile app. And so um, that's also something to be very aware of is, you know, there may be, you know, they call it shadow IT, um, you know, is one way to describe it, uh, yeah. <laughs> of, uh, of, of people that are, that are, you know, getting their own IT solutions because, you know, for whatever reason, the internally provided solutions are not, uh, not as effective. And so what we see in a lot of organizations as a process over time is they, you know, start to understand more about, uh, you know, here are the different types or classes of applications that we have and start to roll those into a scanning program. And so what you see with over time is a progression where you, you know, expand the knowledge of the applications that you have um, you know, and expand the coverage of the applications that you know that you have uh, you know, up until you get to a point where you have everything under coverage. This is called enlightenment uh, in the Buddhist tradition. And I assure you, you will not reach this point. <laughs> but, it's, but it's very much worth, uh, worth striving for. <laughs> Um, another thing to understand is when you talk about, well, you know, I need to test this application, an application test can mean a lot of things. You know, you could be looking at it dynamically while it's running, you could be looking at statically, uh, you know, at, at artifacts while they're at rest. Um, <clears throat> you know, you may be looking at, uh, you know, automated application scanning or as well as manual penetration testing. You know, the same thing, automated static analysis and manual source code review. Um, you know, and asking questions about, you know, is this uh, authenticated testing versus unauthenticated testing? Is this a blind, pen, a blind test or do you have, you know, some sort of informed? Have you included binaries or other libraries in the analysis? And so, um, you know, and it's not to say that you have to do all these things for every application. Again, budget-wise, that is not really, uh, you know, that's not typically like an option. Um, but it is something to understand when you look at crafting, you're looking at crafting your testing program what are the components that you're going to include for different applications and how frequently are you going to include that? Um, and again, this is something where it's important to be honest with yourself, uh, you know, with the resources that you have, what is it realistic for you to expect to, uh, you know, for, for you to be able to do? Some applications matter more than others. 
um, you know, the value or the character of the data being managed, the value of the transactions, you know, cost of downtime. So you, you can't treat all applications the same. Um, you know, you're going to allocate different level of resources, um, you know, and of course, uh, distorting all of the decisions you might make here are compliance requirements that get imposed on you, you know, that may cause you to uh, you know, scan or look at certain applications and not look at others because you have certain compliance requirements. <clears throat> and so, again, what, uh, you know, as you're crafting your program, you need to allocate different levels of, uh, of, of inspection to these and pick the different types of assurance activities uh, you know, based, on, you know, you know, based on the, uh, the, the level and the importance of the application. Um, I want to do a quick demo of an open source application that we've developed and released called ThreadFix. And what it is geared toward doing is helping folks manage their software security program to look not just at a, a single application or help in testing a single application, but instead to look across all the applications in an organization and to start to collect information across all the different assurance activities, all the scanning activities and testing activities that you're undertaking, to start to collect all that so that you can look across the entire portfolio. Uh, and as we'll see, you can start to generate some reporting and metric data that can be valuable in having conversations up with management. Um, this is all freely available. It's a Mozilla license 2.0. Um, you can get the code off of Google Code, although we're probably moving to, uh, uh, probably moving to GitHub here pretty soon. Um, and for some of you may have seen this if you came by um, yesterday in the open source showcase. Uh, okay, and so uh, for, for management, we had we we have the obligatory dashboard, you know, that shows some trending data as well as the applications that have the highest concentration of vulnerabilities. Um, but really, the more interesting view. is looking at the portfolio. And let's see what this is. It's just a minute. There we go. And so inside of ThreadFix, you can keep track of all of the different teams that you have that are developing software, right? So you, know, you can organize this really however you want, but this is a view into all the different groups inside of your organization that are developing and fielding these uh, software systems. And then when you drill into a specific team, you can see all of the applications that they have available um, and a, you know, kind of a heads up view of the currently identified vulnerabilities. You know, for each of these apps, you can go in and upload all the results of your scanning. And so you, know, you can pull in the results. We support most of the popular commercial and open source static and dynamic analysis tools. Um, you know, and so uh, you know, AppScan, Fortify, um, you know, but, uh, uh, Zap uh, is one that we do a lot of work with, um, W3AF. So both on the open source and commercial side, you load all of the results in. And what ThreadFix does is it tracks those over time. Uh, and it also normalizes the data. And so if you're using, so here we see an example of a cross-site scripting vulnerability um, that was identified both by uh, Zed, or by OWASP Zap as well as by AppScan. And so we normalize all the data and stitch it together. So when you go to developers, you have a single unified list of the vulnerabilities that you, um, uh, you know, that you are going to want them to address, as opposed to saying, here's the results from AppScan and here's the results from you know, Zap or Qualys or whatever you have. Um, and what it also lets you do is to track uh, or is to take the, uh, the vulnerabilities and package them up and ship them over to defect tracking systems. And so here we see we've packaged these two vulnerabilities and shipped it over to JIRA. So instead of the developers getting a PDF that said, you know, with like a sticky note on it that says fix these, right? Instead, you can actually package these up and ship the vulnerabilities into the JIRA system that the developers are already using to manage their workload. And ThreadFix maintains a connection or it goes out and pulls those systems. And so here it sees this, this, uh, or this bug or these vulnerabilities, the developers think that they've fixed those whereas these are still open vulnerabilities. And so here we could run another scan, upload the results, and we'd expect these to go away. And the idea is by, by rolling all of these activities under a central server, you know, whether it's manual testing, uh, you know, static testing, dynamic testing, you start to gather data that you can look at. And so you can start to talk about trending across the organization. Um, what I think is actually more interesting is to look at, <clears throat> uh, you can look at progress by vulnerability 
Um, and so what this shows you, and you can't read this, but what it shows you is all the different vulnerability types, how many you found, what percentage of those vulnerabilities you fixed, the average age of the remaining vulnerabilities, and the average time it took you to close those vulnerabilities. All right, and so you can start to gather metrics on your software assurance program. And are folks familiar with like the reports from the, uh, the, the, the White Hat and the Veracode folks, the, you know, the different reports that they've issued? Really, really good reading, worth taking a look at, because they show for the sites they're testing you know, this type of data. <clears throat> and so what this allows you to do is to take metrics on your program, and you can go up to management and say, uh, you know, hey, other people in our industry are fixing twice as many vulnerabilities or twice the percentage of vulnerabilities, and it's taking them half the amount of time. You know, we have to devote more resources to this, or we you know, run the risk of falling farther behind. Um, what it also lets you do <clears throat> is to track the frequency of scanning. And so you can also go in and look here and say, you know, we've got seven critical applications. You know, one of them we looked at one month ago, one of them we looked at two months ago, one of them we haven't looked at in over a year. Okay, well, let's prioritize that application. If it's a critical application and we haven't looked at it for a year, perhaps that needs to go to the top of the stack um, for, us to, uh, you know, for us to take a look at because you know, we're falling behind. Or, or here we see that we've got you know, high classified applications that have never been looked at. And so that's a way of keeping track of your activities so that you can start to identify potential gaps in your coverage where you haven't been inspecting things uh, on a schedule, on, on the type of schedule that you should have. Good. Um, excellent. And so that's, that's really kind of what I wanted to go through. And I'll open up. I think we have a minute or a couple minutes for questions. Is that true? Excellent. A couple minutes for questions. Let me see. Uh, we did. Uh, yeah, so, you know, again, talk about looking, looking at it from a program perspective, you've got to build a portfolio, characterize the effectiveness of your efforts, you know, build a plan for coverage, and then monitor progress. And I will, there we go. And uh, yeah, I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Right. Ah, yeah, that comes. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? I'll come to you later, just a second. There was the first question was here in the back. Um, you only talked about um, interfacing with automated scan results. Uh -huh. Can you also interface with manual scan results, like say manual pen test? Uh, yeah, and, and so, the, uh, so the, the way that you can handle that is like in the application view, you can basically, um, there's a just to show you. There's a button you can click on to add a manual result. So if we drill in here, go to here, go to here, um, you can go in and add a manual finding as well. Um, that interface is a little clunky if you have a lot to do. And so the, there's also ThreadFix exposes a REST uh, interface, and so and it has a command line client. And so if you have a simple like JSON or XML format or comma CSV, you can write a, a simple script that will like go through and, and you know, manually attach those results as well. The one thing is that you find the vulnerabilities. The other thing is that you keep track if they are open, still open. And so I know the approach about writing out emails and uh, collecting the data together from the different uh, developers and then putting it together again in the platform. Mm -hmm. So is there here any way of more automation of this process? For example, when a vulnerability open, a workflow is started, the workflow automatically goes to the developer. He can then change the status when he has done it and things like that. So yeah, and, and so um, a lot of that comes down to a question of how of internally how do organizations work. The, like, the most high performing um, app security programs that I've worked with have pretty close integration between the security folks doing the testing and the developers. Um, and in, in environments like that, again, you're pushing, you're taking the vulnerability data, turning them into software defects, um, you know, and you know, if that's happening automatically, that is fantastic, uh, and that's certainly something you could script together. The challenge is in a lot of environments, in, in some environments that I've worked in, there's a lot of resistance where you have to sit down, you know, you have a meeting, right, and here's the security people with their vulnerabilities, and here's the software developers with their schedules, and you have to negotiate more to say, well, you know, these are really important, so fix these this 
time, and uh, you know, it, it really it comes down to a question of in your organization what's acceptable, um, and also in cases where you've got applications where you've been through the scan or where, where you don't where you're not generating each scan isn't generating a large number of vulnerabilities. It makes it more acceptable. Um, you know, if you if you've got security testing, for example, rolled into your continuous integration, then it is a lot easier to say, I ran a scan, we found two new cross-site scriptings. I'm going to automatically make that a bug and assign it to a developer using Git Blame or something like that. Um, and so, you know, as organizations you know start to move faster and adapt adopt some of those like DevOps type of uh, of, of approaches, we've seen some really really cool stuff that people do. Um, and you can script a lot of that with a thread fix, but the biggest challenge in most organizations is to get to the point where it is acceptable for security to automatically assign things to developers to do without that being a, a giant fight. Okay, so time is up, unfortunately. Please, let's uh, thank the speaker again. So you have uh, five minutes, a five minutes break to change the room.